If you have your Bibles, pull them out for me real quick or your phones. I'm so glad you're here today. Glad that you come be a part of this great day. A lot of great work done from the staff. My name is Brother J.D. Howell. I'm the pastor here at the church, and God's doing some neat things here. But I've enjoyed Brother Young. Wasn't that a great message that he preached that first session? That was true. Did, did God touch your heart? Amen? He said some great things. It was tremendous. Now, there are a couple of things I'm going to have to correct, though. I'm going to have to correct a couple of things. Don't tell him. All right, don't tell him. First of all, he said that the cold weather is a curse. Did you hear that? Come on, did you hear that? And he tried to use some Bible to back it up. I would direct his attention to where Jesus talked about heaven and hell. I'm just saying that uh, only one of them is described as being hot. <laughs> Help me here. Now, he lives in Florida. I was born in Florida, and I moved to Michigan. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So don't tell him. We'll tell him. Well, we won't tell him that. And then, and then I tell you what. Then he's talking about, he's talking about Cedar Point, Amusement Rides, and throwing up. Could not help but remind me of the first time I was a senior at Cedar Point when I was in 10th grade. The second ride I rode. At that time, the ride's now gone called the Mean Streak. Anyone remember the Mean Streak? It was all wooden, and it shook you up like this. Second ride I rode. I mean, how many loved the Mean Streak when it was still there? It's gone now, right? They tore it down, right? Is it still there or is it gone? It's gone. I thought they tore it down a couple years back. And uh, I did not know at this point that I threw up on roller coasters. I didn't know it, and neither did the girl in front of me. But what's really cool is after this ride, we both knew the same thing, that the roller coaster is making me sick. Tremendous thing. He talked about that. And, and then he mentioned, uh, if you've ever had the police say, come out with your hands up. Uh, it wasn't the best day of my life. <laughs> I was out, uh, and we were out soul winning and inviting folks for the bus route and to come to church on a, on a uh, was I think maybe a Thursday or Friday afternoon. I was in downtown Saginaw, no, and in some, one of the side streets. I was driving my little red car I had back then. It was a, a little red car, and I liked it. And all of a sudden, Pastor Scott Cowling was with me. He'll be running some of the food down there. All of a sudden, I'm driving down this road, and I see two police cars come ripping around the corner, and where I'm next to the, like, park next to a curb, two of them come, pop the curb, throw their doors open, and the police officers jump out with their handguns drawn toward my vehicle. As Pastor Kelly, he'll verify this story. Almost simultaneously, two police cars came from the front, and I was boxed in with police officers with guns drawn, telling me to get out of my car with my hands up. Guess what I did? I got out with my hands up. You say, well, what happened? Why did that happen, Pastor Howell? What were you doing? That, well, apparently, apparently they had just spotted and called in that someone in a red car just like mine was waving a gun out the window at houses down the road. And they thought it was me. All right? Very quickly they figured out that I wasn't uh, the perpetrator, and so I was, I was fine. But he's talking about the police service, they come up with your hands up. I'm like, okay, guilty again. So it was just, you know, a very good message for me. I learned a whole bunch. If you have your Bibles, if you would please turn to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. In my Bible, um, chapter 34, it's page 334, in case you're wondering. Um, but if you don't have my Bible, that'll be no help to you. So 2 Chronicles, chapter number 34. I want to talk to you just for a few minutes and, and we just have a short amount of time when I'm done I'm going to have an invitation we're going to pray and then you get to go to lunch eat some food I realize that after I'm done you get to eat so the quicker I'm done the quicker you get to eat right? so you want me to go quick don't you? well as long as you pay attention well I will but if not I'll just take a long time to explain it and I can, I can ramble for a long, long, long time and just ask my kids. I have three kids. Uh, Johnny is 11. James, my second son, is 9. And my little daughter, Danielle, is 7. My wife accuses my daughter of getting things from me that even she doesn't get. 
I don't think it's true, but, but this year, like, I'm a real big don't listen to Christmas music before Thanksgiving guy. Don't look at me like I'm a hater. What's wrong with you? Yeah, I see you. I got eyes. I can still see from this. Not that far. I always Thanksgiving, but this year, my, my daughter, we're riding home uh, one night in October. She's in the back. She goes, hey, Daddy. Yes, baby girl. She goes, can we make a rule? I said, what's that, baby girl? She's like, well, can we start listening to Christmas music at the second snow? My wife says that she's sitting next to me. She was in the passenger seat. I was driving. Danielle's in the back seat. My wife's like thinking. This is what she tells me she's thinking. Oh, no. Oh, no, honey. You're about to get your heart broken. You're going you're gonna to know. Daddy doesn't move on this. She's thinking this in her mind. Daddy's not going to say yes. It's going to be disappointing for you. And then she's shocked when I'm like, okay, that's a fine rule. And, and then she went, my wife went to, I can't believe it, but I have three kids. You know that there are such things as good kids and bad kids? You know, right? But good cooks and bad cooks. You know that too? Good basketball players and bad basketball players. Good soccer players and bad soccer players. Uh, uh, good singers and not so good singers. Come on. You may be sitting, I'm going to sit next to one that would be not so good this morning. All right, all right. Some of you are honest out there. There are times you, you, you find a young person, it seems like it's a seventh grader sometimes. Maybe, well, we'll call it sixth graders today. We like seventh graders today. They're like, oh man, I'll I smoke you in basketball, Pastor Howell. I'm not a good basketball player. All right, I am not. But you get that kid who's talking about that, right? Oh, man, I'm going to smoke all you guys. I'm going to tear you up. Then you see them on the basketball court, and they're horrible. Ugh. Right? You're like, you talked a lot, but, dude, you're sorry. All right, you're awful. Some people will be like, oh, yeah, I can play soccer. And I actually like soccer. It's kind of like, that's my favorite sport probably. There's some that are like really good at it, mainly, but some that are just, uh, okay, you don't know what you're doing. I got to one time, any soccer players out there? Come on, raise them up there high. Let me see soccer players out there. How many hate soccer? You know, I'm going to preach longer now. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I got to one time practice with a guy who, who played for a country for their World Cup team. And I've, I've played with some good players, but this guy was amazing. He was really good. You know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll be on YouTube and I'll see some, uh, some fails you ever seen those on YouTube? The fails? Man, they always start the same way. Uh, you know, this lady's riding a bike down the street, and like your heart's already jumping because you know something bad's going to happen. All right? And you're just waiting for it. And all of a sudden, boom! Go, 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 go. You're like, yeah, this is great. And then this guy's skateboarding. Like, oh, no! Boom! Then they go down, and oh, man, there's fails. You know, it would be bad, it would be sad, and, and, and so terrible if with all that we have from God and His Word and great comments like this and your youth pastor and youth workers and your pastors and your, your parents, if you had the opportunity to be good and weren't. If you had the opportunity to please the Lord with your life and, and you didn't, right? You see, just because you claim to be a Christian doesn't mean you're doing what God says. Just like, just because you claim to be able to play basketball or to cook or to do something else doesn't mean you have a skill. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, we see a young man by the name of Josiah. He's a familiar character in the Bible. He was a king. I think this morning uh, he, he'll help us, help us know what God is looking for so that we can please him. So we can be a successful Christian in God's eyes. Let's pray as we look at God's word today. Lord, I thank you for these brief moments that we have. Lord, I thank you for the message that Brother Young already brought. I pray now, Lord, you'd help us to look at your word. That your word would touch us. Lord, your spirit would convict us. And that we would respond to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Give your Bibles open to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. I want you to notice a few things. And I'm going to talk about this morning what a tender heart looks like. You know, the Bible wants us to have a tender heart. But sometimes we don't know what that is. You see, I like to cook steak. I like steak. Does anyone else like steak in here? 
So one time years ago when I was youth pastor, we had an activity, B-Y-O-M, bring your own meat. And we grilled it. And some kids brought steak, some kids brought hamburgers, and one idiot brought hot dogs. There was this one young man who was in ninth grade at the time, and, and the other adult myself were grilling, and, and I would grill it until they said they wanted it, all right? And uh, we grilled this piece of steak or a uh, steak that they had, and boy, you grilled it. And he said, no, no, not done yet. So we left it on there. A couple minutes later, are you sure? No, 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 keep on cooking it. All right, a little bit longer. Right, how about now? Keep on cooking it. When we were done, that thing was like this. All right, like a piece of wood. Now, I know what a tender steak looks like. I know what a tender bruise feels like. Ow, don't touch that. That hurts. But sometimes we don't know what a tender heart is, though God wants us to have one. Second Chronicles chapter 34, we're introduced to this young man by the name of Josiah. The Bible says in verse 1 that Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. You see, as we look at Josiah and find out what a tender heart looks, looks like, when I see Josiah, I first of all see that there's no place for excuses about having a tender heart. He was eight when he started, and as he turned toward God, he was probably around 16 years old. But you can say, well, I'll have a tender heart when I'm older. Josiah started when he was young. There's no excuses. You say, well, well Brother Howell, I, I don't come from a family like someone else has here, and maybe I don't even know my dad or know my mom, and my parents aren't saved. The Bible says that Josiah's father's name was Ammon. He was a wicked king more than other wicked kings. Josiah didn't come from a great home. And I'm glad the Bible includes that detail because some of us can identify with that, that we didn't come from great homes. But Josiah didn't use this as an excuse. He didn't let it way uh, sidetrack him. He still decided to follow God. He had no excuse in life. And you know what? It gets a little tiring sometimes when people don't want to follow God because of excuses. We can have good excuses. I've got three kids. I've heard lots of excuses. Why isn't your room clean, Johnny? Well, enter excuse. Right? I didn't hear you. I didn't understand you. I didn't know you wanted the room cleaned. I thought you wanted the room cleaned. Because there's a big difference there, right? Come on, young people. You've done this to your parents before, right? Yeah. Take out the trash. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay, why isn't the trash out? Well, well, you know, I, I was going to, but I forgot. I forgot. You know, that is an excuse. Like, what's supposed to happen right then? Your parents say, oh, I didn't realize you forgot life is good. Do your parents say that? They say, oh, I didn't know you have a memory problem. No problem. You know what? All is well. Don't worry about it. I'll take it out for you. Is that what your parents say? I don't care if you forgot. Get the trash outside right now, right? Josiah didn't make any excuses. I'm too young. Not what Josiah said. My dad was wicked, did not follow God. That's not what Josiah said. He didn't make any excuses. We see in verse number 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he's 16 now, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. Now the Bible says he sought after the God of David, his father. But see, David wasn't his, his real exact next in line father. Right, David was like a great, 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 great grandpa. What the Bible is showing us is that David was such an example that anyone who followed God was like David because he was the example. And all the other kings, it seems like after David, and the Solomon, then Rehoboam, and all these other kings, and Ammon, and Manasseh, they were always compared back to this guy named King David back here. And so when Josiah, while he was yet young, followed the Lord, the Bible tells us he followed it like David, who was his heritage. He was yet young. The Bible tells us that he, he broke down the end of verse number three, the groves and high places and carved images and molten images. What I see is no exceptions. Now, Josiah, what happened was he was in a country when he became king at the age of eight that did not love God. 
He was among people that did not love God, and they worshipped false gods. They would burn uh, sacrifices and have images and idols made. A few years back, I was in the land of Cambodia. In Cambodia, they still worship idols, like physical idols, like you could touch the rock that's carved. You can touch the wood. And people will bring incense. They'll make offerings to these idols. And Josiah was in that kind of country at this time. And Josiah, because he followed God, there's no exceptions, he began to tear down all of these false idols. Now help me here. Understand something, that people worship idols, right? That's what idols are for to worship, right? Do you think they liked having their idol torn down? If you're worshiping an idol, and you're offering incense, and someone goes, goes look at that, boom, it kicks it over. Think it make them happy or angry? Think it make him angry to tear down an idol. But Josiah didn't care about that. He had no exceptions. He wanted to worship God and please God. He wanted to obey God. And he got rid of what God wanted him to get rid of in the country. You know, that's a great example for us, young person, to get rid of what God wants you to get rid of. Brother Young alluded to that, did he not, with limitations? There are some things that God is going to want you to get rid of in your life. Josiah did that, no exceptions. And then he had no empty commitments. He said, the Bible says he did this while he was yet young. You know what Josiah was doing? He was paying attention. A few years back, I was in my house, my first or second house that I ever bought. My, actually, my wife bought this house while I was out of town. Listen, man, remember this, boys. Wives do that. They buy things when you're gone. This time she bought a house. All right, so it's fine. We enjoyed living there. So I'm in the house. It's a Sunday afternoon. It wasn't a large house. It was a small house. My room and my wife's room was right here, and then the bathroom was right here. In between that little hallway, there was a corner of a wall. I've lived at this house now at that time for about five years. Plenty of time for me to know the layout of the house, right? Sunday afternoon, I'm not paying attention. I got up from an afternoon nap on Sunday night. I walked toward the bathroom, and I hit the wall, boom, right in the middle of my head and forehead. And it left a mark, an embarrassing mark. Anybody ever have like something embarrassing happen to your face? Anybody ever happen to you on Sunday when you're coming to church? At that time, I led the music at First Baptist Church. So for the next like two hours at my house, I'm trying to rub this mark out. Because I know what's going to happen. I'm coming to church and everyone, everyone is going to make fun of this. That night, I'm leading songs. You know, people in the, in the congregation are doing down here, right where you're sitting, right where you're sitting. Look at that. Look at his face. Look at that. They come up, hey, hey, Pastor Tom, you got a mark on your face. I'm going to make a mark on your face. I got this stupid mark from a stupid wall in my stupid house because I was stupid. Right? It wasn't the wall's fault, was it? That wall didn't grow up while I was sleeping. It was there every day that I owned that house. The wall didn't move. I ran into it. I made the mistake. I wasn't paying attention. Well, I want us to pay attention real quick, if you would. Now look at our text for today in verse 27. Verse 27. When God says something about Josiah, where he says, because thine heart was what? Verse 27. Because thine heart was what? Tender. Thy heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, and when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend to thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Let me give you three characteristics, very briefly, of a tender heart. The first one is this. A tender heart is a heart that hears. That's what the Bible says right there. He says, your heart was tender. I'm going to bless you now. Your heart was tender because you had a heart that heard. 
Listen, young person, if you're going to have a tender heart toward God, you've got to learn to listen to God. How does God speak to us? A couple different ways. He speaks to us through his word. As you read his Bible every day, he will speak to you. He will tell you things that he likes and things he dislikes and how to treat other people, how to treat your parents, how to treat your siblings, how to treat church members, how to treat people who are not saved. He tells you how to treat people. He tells you how to live a righteous and holy life. He tells you how to sing at church. He talks about all that. He'll speak to you through his word. He speaks to you through preaching. He speaks to you through the Holy Spirit, and he speaks to you through godly influences, authority, and friends. But we have to be at a place where we can listen to God. When I travel on an airplane, I use these things called noise-canceling headphones. Guess what they do? Cancel the noise. You know why? Because I'll get on an airplane. I don't want to speak to anybody else. I don't want to hear the announcement about safety. If the plane crashes, I'm not going to pull out an inflatable life vest because from 30,000 feet, I'm probably not going to survive. All right? So I put this thing on, and I block out everything else, and I especially don't want to hear the crying baby right behind me. You know, young person, sometimes we put those on for God. We sit in a great sermon, a great service, and God's trying to speak to us. He's talking to you about something wrong in your life and what you need to, how do you need to follow him? And we put these on. I can't hear you. I'm not listening. You know, to have a humble heart, we take them off. We let God speak to us. A heart that hears. Most annoying sound in the world the sound of a mosquito. We go up to wilderness camp with the boys, and you lay in that tent at night. As you lay down, all is quiet. And then you hear this. I hate it when it stops. It's about to strike. Right? And you wildly slap over your whole body. Slap, 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 slap. Like somehow you're going to defeat this mosquito in the dark. Yeah, I got it. Bzzz. Slap, 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 slap. Yeah, it's gone. Bzzz. Oh, man. God wants to speak to us. I was one of seven kids growing up. I was, I'm the oldest boy. I have an older sister. She's like a second mom to me. It's so wonderful in my life. How many have an older sister? Is she like a second mom to you, too? Tell you what to do? That's good. Okay. And I'm, I'm the oldest boy. I have an older sister. And uh, there's seven kids. I could identify with Brother Young calling us all the, uh, my parents calling us all the wrong names. I don't think I had a name until I was like 15 anyway. And um, boy, but our parents would, would do certain things to get our attention. You know, we're sitting there in church. We'd all be in the same pew, all, all at times six, seven, eight, nine of us by the end. And you were messing around at church, right? And my dad, he'd snap his finger like that and point. We knew what that meant. That meant to pay attention, right? You know, don't do this. If your dad does that, snaps and points, don't be like, what, dad? What are you trying to say? Oh, wait, I can snap too, dad. And snap, don't snap back at him. It's a bad idea. Just take my word. It's a bad idea. But my dad would sometimes whistle for us when he wanted us to come. He whistled like this. Like that. that. That's his whistle. That is my dad's whistle. Try that with me. Can you do that? Okay, good. All right, good. Now, some of you can't whistle. My dad can whistle. All right, that's good. I was at Walmart a few years back. I'm an adult. I'm married. I have my own job. I buy my own toilet paper, and I have kids. I heard that whistle. And I'm like, I, I went, I'm with my wife. I said, that's my dad. He's here. I just, that is my dad. I know it. Sure enough, two hours over was my dad whistling to my little brother. I had heard that whistle before, and when he whistled, I knew what that was. You need to be close enough to God so that when he speaks to you, you know that voice. A heart that hears. A heart that hears is a tender heart, but it's also a heart that is humble. So a heart that hears and a heart that's humble. That's what the Bible says. He says, you've humbled yourself. You've done what I've asked. You see, we can't let pride get in the way. Pride says, I can do this all by myself. I'm strong enough. I'm smart enough. But a heart that is tender says, God, your way is better. I like to lift weights. I don't know that I'm really good at it, but I, I go regularly to lift weights. There are some times when I'm lifting weights, 
that I can lift a weight, and there are some times I can't. There are some weight that's too heavy for me, so I get someone to help me. Because if I do it all by myself, I'm going to have a problem. I was there one time, and I decided to, to bench a little bit, little bit of weight, more than kind of pushing the top edge of where I would be at. So I had a guy come, what's called spot you. He stands behind, so just in case the weight comes down, he can catch it so you don't die. It's generally a bad idea to die while lifting. So I'm there. He's like, hey, do you want help getting this, this weight off the top? I said, nope, nope, no problem, I got it. I pulled it off, and the weight came crashing down. It was a lot of weight that day. Boom, almost straight down, I caught it. He goes to grab it. If he wasn't there, you know what? I would have been in trouble. I would have been sunk that day. You see, a, a humble heart says, God, you can help me. That's what Brother Young was referring to when he says that we can go to God with his invitation. He'll, his yoke, his limitation is easy. He'll help you. You can do more with him. Remember the Titanic? Remember the, that big boat? Yeah, it sunk. It sunk. Good price on Titanic tickets. They had a lot of pride. In fact, they said it couldn't be sunk, but God sunk it. You see, you can't grow, you can't be close to God or tender to God if you're saying no to God. Uh, think about this phrase, young people. You cannot grow spiritually if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not praying, and if you are saying no to God. If God speaks to you and you say no, that's not a humble, humble heart. The last one is this. A tender heart is one that hears, one that's humble, and one that heeds, or one that obeys. If you want a tender heart this morning, young person, you need to obey God. You see, it's not enough just to hear God. It's not enough just to say, okay, God, not only do I hear you, I know your way is better. If you're going to have a tender heart, and Josiah, we see in the passage, he said, you did what I asked you to do. A tender heart is one that obeys God. With my kids, if I say, Johnny, take out the trash. Yes, sir. He's heard me, and he's humble. But what does it matter if he doesn't do the, take out the trash? Will I be happy? Will I say, that's okay? Yeah, that's all right. I'm glad you heard me. I'm glad you're humble about it. No, I'll be like, no, but you didn't do what I said. You see, sometimes we're in a service or we're listening to a, a close friend or authority and they're trying to teach us from God's word and we, we hear it. We have the headphones off. We say, yep, yeah, absolutely, we'll do it. But if we don't obey, we don't have a tender heart. See, jo Josiah's heart was tender because not only did he hear, not only was he humble, but he obeyed. He heeded what God said. It's a time when God was speaking to my heart about something and I was saying no. You ever done that before? I have. God was speaking. I knew God was speaking to me. He was saying, J.D., you need to deal with this situation right here. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to because I thought it was going to be hard and I was saying no. There was a sermon when God spoke to me. And I knew that I needed to obey God. And that I would not grow as a Christian. I would not please God anymore if I did not do what he asked me to do. I took care of it. And it wasn't as bad as I thought. You see, sometimes we don't obey because we're afraid. If I really obey God, it's going to be bad. You'll find out when you obey God, it's going to be good. Sometimes we don't obey God because... We like the problem too much. In our lives, I picture uh, sometimes sin as weeds, right? The Bible talks about it as weeds. You know what? In your garden, you don't plant weeds, but sometimes you love the weeds in your life. Lord, don't take down this weed. It's beautiful weed. It's my favorite dandelion in my life. You got to obey God, and if you obey God, if you listen and humble and obey God, you will have a tender heart. Young person today, I want to ask you a question. Do you have what God considers a tender heart? Do you listen when God speaks? Do you have headphones on? Take them off. Do you have a humble heart? God, your way is better than my way. And do you have an obeying heart? If you don't have those three characteristics, you don't have a tender heart. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes today, if you would, please. One of this morning, though you may want to have a tender heart, if God were to talk to us, he would not say you had a tender heart.
I want to say, Pastor Howell, you know what, this morning as you were speaking, God spoke to me, and I want to have a tender heart, but I don't have one right now. Would you pray for me that I would have a tender heart? I need to have a heart that, that listens, that hears, or a heart that's humble, a heart that heeds, obeys. Who would say, Pastor Howell, while you were speaking, God spoke to me. I want to have a tender heart. Would you pray for me because God spoke to me that I'll have a tender heart? Would you slip your hand and let me see an amen? I see the hand. Who else? Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Who else? I want to have a tender heart. And God touched me this morning. I don't have one right now. Maybe I'm not listening when I'm supposed to listen. Or maybe I'm not obeying when I'm supposed to obey. Who else? Pastor, I didn't raise my hand before. I'll raise it now. I want to have a tender heart. God spoke to me when you spoke. Amen. 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 Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask us to do something. In just a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to have what we call an invitation. An invitation. At that time, we'll stand. and I'd invite you to come and pray at the front. You say, well, Pastor Howell, someone will see me. That's right. They may see you. What would keep you from praying is not humility, but pride. But I invite you, in just a moment, we stand and pray. If God spoke to you, do you speak to God and ask him to help you? Lord, I thank you for this time and for these young people. Lord, many have indicated that you spoke to them and that they have a desire to have a tender heart, to listen to you, to obey you, and to have humility before you. Lord, I pray that as we have invitation, that they would respond the right way, that they would seek your face. Lord, give them the grace to follow you. In Jesus' name.